Good morning. Hey, it is good to be in God's house and His presence, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, uh, something uh, that we did do something different, just to make sure you're aware. Uh, we've been putting our sermon notes in our worship guide for several years now. We realize a lot of you weren't taking the worship guides or you weren't getting the notes that way, and then they were just being reused. So uh, what I decided to do is put the worship guides out in each of the foyers here or each of the, the little doorways here in their little rack. So if you want them, you can take them. Amen. And if you didn't get some this morning because you're, you were not aware that if you want them, raise your hands. Our ushers will give you one while you keep your hand up. Just keep it up long enough if that's what you want. But always, we want to encourage you, use the church app, Love of Christ Church DE for Delaware. Uh, you can get the app and you can download the notes and you can follow along and then it saves it into a file for you so that you'll always have it electronically because sometimes these paper ones can get lost. So I hope that that helps you as you do and uh, follow along. We, I believe that you get things, you know, you learn things. You learn them through your, your eye and you learn them through your ear and you learn them through your hand. And so sometimes when you write, when you do all three, you hear it, you see it, you write it. It then sticks with you. So that's why we encourage people to take notes. Uh, Also, just wanted to, hopefully you got one of these. If you didn't, uh, you can get these at the Info Center. And it's a little summary of some India projects that uh, Pastor Barbara and I came back from India uh, a couple months ago. And uh, we realized for quite a few years now, we've just been like trying to resist uh, meeting all the needs that are there because as Pastor PK, our head guy there, he says the needs in India are like an ocean. <laughs> and the, but you know what? Instead of saying no to everything, the Lord really put on my heart that this is part of our church family and a good father would always try to do what he could. Amen. And that's really the heart that we came away from there. And so we've been talking to PK and we really took probably maybe many, 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 many projects that these guys have been asking for help for sometimes for years. And we prioritized them and we came up with uh, six projects here that uh, we thought you'd like to know about. And what we're going to do is just let you know about them and give you the information because we have a chance to make a life change In this region, we have a chance to make eternal difference because this is like absolutely good ground to sow some seed, financial seed. And I believe in that principle when you sow seed in something spiritual and then it multiplies, it keeps producing rewards for you in heaven. So we wanted to give you an opportunity. The trustees have reviewed these projects and we all are in agreement that we should move on these as quickly as we can. But I wanted to give you a chance. We're not asking you to give money. We just want you to pray. Ask God, should you give something extra? Should you, above what you normally give, not your tie, not your normal stuff, but maybe something extra and uh, designate it to Indian projects? And let me just show a few pictures of these if we can. The first one up there, let me just kind of talk about. This is a village. This is actually outside of the house. The, this whole family lives in that little house there and uh, probably about eight, six or eight people. And they worship out there in front of their yard, open air, And one of our pastors came to our Bible school. We graduated. We sent him back to this area. He ended up winning his father and his grandfather, both Sikhs to the Lord. And in just two years' time, he has like won hundreds of people to the Lord. Can we give God praise for that? Amen. But they're extremely poor. This is a village. It's extremely poor. They have no nowhere. But God has given them an opportunity to get a piece of land. And that's what this is. Sometimes land is not for sale, especially to believers. So to have an opportunity to purchase some is really great. So we're going for that project, seven thousand dollars approximately. We can buy land, and then they can start worshiping on that land, and then slowly we'll be able to do that. Our, our second project is again another piece of land that's available. Here's one of our pastors. This is actually the son of Pastor Herdot, who was the guy that helped us found a ministry there, and he ended up going into a village where there were no Christians. And he ended up making a relationship there, and he won one family to the Lord. And then he started going to their house and holding service, and then he won another family to the Lord, and then he won another. And we believe that this is a place where the gospel is just right, this whole village. And they found a piece of land, and that's it right there. It's a very small piece of land. We're standing on it, praying and blessing it. And for $7,000, we can get that piece of land. 
and they can start worshiping all, they'll set up a little tent, and that whole village has potential to coming to the Lord, amen? So it's just amazing. Our third project there is uh, uh, for 31,000, and if, as you look at this picture, this is kind of like, the, it looks kind of rough right now, but this whole back wall there, that blue wall, was where our original pastor, Hadat, and his wife, they lived in two little rooms. That was their whole existence. And then they, we ha- helped them build this church, and now it seats about probably five or 600 people. Well, it is packed to the gills every Sunday. They can't get any more people out. And this pastor, uh, Hadat's son, who's one of our chief overseers, this is the city of Batala, and he is going, he is already knocking the walls out by faith. He is ticking his little bit of money he does have. And he's going to, he believes that God wants him to expand this facility so that he can reach more people. And what they, while he's done this, right behind that blue wall, a little piece of land has come available also. And when he can get that, normally what they do is in their culture, people come there and they come so, so far that after church, they have teams of people who actually feed them some like just beans and rice. And so they need an area to prepare the food because they're going to enclose all of this area. And there's a whole lot of area uh, adjacent to this where we're going to expand. I believe we'll be able to sit close to a thousand people. Amen. And this is our headquarters. This is where we originally started. This is the city we had our very first crusade in in 1998. This is where God opened the door for Love of Christ Church in the ministry. And so we feel like if we should have a a place there that is like uh, the sign that says this is our, our key ministry there. So that's only $31,000. We can do that and finish that. And then uh, one of the other projects I'm gonna, is number, uh, number five, I think it is. Yes, number five. I'm going to skip a couple. And this is a, a church of Pastor Charles. He's another one of our overseers. This is his church, and that's the extent of the land he has. And people, every Sunday, they're sitting in every square inch of the floor, up the stairs. They're sitting on the roof. They're sitting out in the the street. They're just completely, totally packed to the gills also. And he's been really asking us to help him for several, several years. And we believe it's now time. He has found a piece of land that he can build on and expand. And for $32,000, we can open that up and just expand and explode that ministry. So there's about 80, almost $90,000 worth of projects there. If you would like to participate, ask the Lord. Maybe you want to just give something. Just You can designate it. You can go online. You can use the church app. Uh, You can designate it. Or if you want to write a check, you can just put it in the menu. But take this home, pray about it, discuss it as a family. And if that's something that you want to do, then do it. Amen. And because Pastor Barb and I are going to personally involve, give to this because we believe this is great ground to sow into. So we just want to inv- have, give you that same opportunity as we go forward as, and work on this. Hey, we're going to wrap up our sermon today, our series on uh, what would Jesus undo. You know, we've been talking about years ago when they all wore the wristbands, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, maybe there's some things he would like to undo in our life. And the guys have been just coming and bringing it and just bringing great messages. And this is the wrap up this. I had a message planned in this series. And while I was uh, uh, recuperating from some little surgery on my face and some other things, uh, the Lord really spoke to me one morning in my devotion And I saw something in a passage of Scripture that really, I have never seen it like that. And I believe today is going to be a a message that is going to change many lives here. I believe you'll have ears to hear, and if you'll have eyes to see, and if you open your heart to really hear what God wants for you, I believe that this could be a life-changing message for you. So please, I'll give it full attention and and just let the, the Holy Spirit work in you. As we do, and let me pray for that end right now. Father, I thank you for the power of your word, your Holy Spirit that brings it. Teach, Lord. That's what you come. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. Open every eye so that we can receive this and live in this place of joy and happiness. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, many times, and if I said, what would Jesus undo? And the thing that he would undo is our point of view. Jesus wants to undo our point of view. Now you say, what do you mean, Pastor? I I don't quite understand it. Well, it was really kind of amazing when I found this passage that 
we look at our life like that, that we live our lives usually from at least two points of view. That we have one point of view in our life that we might would call sacred, or some of you might use the word religious or faith or whatever. It has God in it, and you're living part of that life this morning, or maybe you're watching online, or you're in Middletown, wherever you are. You're living a a spiritual aspect of your life, spiritual side, uh, a sacred side, a side that is involving God and keeping God in it. But then we go away from here and we live our lives from a human standpoint, another point of view, where we just live our lives and do our work and have our kids and go through the motion. And we live those two lives separately. And I think what God wants us to remember and see is that they're not to be separate, but they're to be uniquely tied together. And I'm going to show you from this scripture what we want to find out. So in that, we need to understand that what point of view we're living from and what point of view we're thinking from is eternally important, internally important. Let me show you why. Now, we're going to be studying out of Matthew 16 and verses 23 through 27, but let me, for the sake of your notes and time, I didn't put it in there, but Jesus was, just before this, he was telling his disciples, And Jesus was instructing them, and he told them very clear and plainly, it said, that it was necessary. Everybody say necessary. Necessary. This is what he said to them. Guys, it is necessary for me to go to Jerusalem. And then he told them these several things. First of all, when I go, I'm going to suffer many terrible things. Everybody say suffer. Y'all didn't say suffer as loud, did you? Amen. There is suffering in his life. He said, I'm going to suffer terrible things at the hand of the elders, the leading priests, the teachers, the religious law. And then he says, and I will be killed. But on the third day, I would be raised from the dead. Now, Peter, you know, Peter is always the guy that was quick to jump and speak and everything. He took him aside and began to reprimand him. Can you imagine reprimanding Jesus? They must have been good friends, hadn't they? They must have been close buds. Like, you reprimand Jesus. I don't think he quite grasped the fullness of who Jesus was. I don't think none of them had completely grasped it. They were grappling with it. And even this concept of dying and raising from the dead, to him he couldn't grasp it, even though he was being told these things. And then it says, you know, when he goes over there, he began to reprimand him. And then he said these words to Jesus, heaven forbid. Isn't that a funny word? Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. In other words, as far as I am, as far as I have life and strength and breath, I'm not going to let that happen to you. Now, this is the passage we come to, and some of you have read it before, and we're looking, that's in your notes, and it'll be on your screen. It says, Jesus turned to Peter, and he said... Get away from me, who? Satan. Satan. All of a sudden, he looks at his intimately close friend, his best bud, the guy who felt close enough that he could reprimand him, the man who he said was his rock and, you know, and that he would move this church forward, that he entrusted him and his other 11 disciples with this job of carrying out this task. He turns to Peter, and he calls him Satan. Now, I don't know about you, but when you get to heaven, is that what you want to hear Jesus say when you walk up to the door, you know, and say, uh, I'm ready to come in for eternal life, and he looks at you, ah, Satan. Now, that's not the word you want to hear, amen? What you want to hear is good and faithful servant. He says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. I don't really, wasn't going to teach him that, but that really jumped off the page to me. When you have the wrong point of view, it's a dangerous trap. It's a place that can destroy you. And then he says these words, which I get the whole context of this message from. You were seeing things merely from what? A human point of view, not from God. And then he said to his disciples, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. And if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. Isn't that amazing? If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. 
But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels and the, the glory of his Father and will judge. And that word judge means reward. Everybody say reward. It doesn't mean like he's going to Put, put you under the jail. No, it means he's, he's assessing all the things you've done good and he's going to give you a reward. That's what the word, I looked it up. He says, all people according to what? Their deeds. Now, when I looked in this passage, something came to me that he had the wrong point of view. He had the point of view of man. That there are at least, now I'm not saying there's not more, but there are probably maybe only two that we know of for certain from this passage. There's a point of view that is man, worldly. In fact, the sad part is Jesus equates having your own manly or worldly point of view, men's point of view, the normal thinking as Satan. Now that's how serious this is. This is not like... Well, I just live my life and do my life and, you know, go through life. No, no, this is serious. And then there's another point of view, which is God's point of view. And what Jesus was telling us is you got to make certain that you're living with God's point of view. He's going to change our point of view from the worldly, from the normal, from just being uh, the normal viewpoint that everyone else has to his points of view. Now, look what he says to there. And then he says, and found in here, when I really get this, there's a secret for happiness. Now, this is the other part I didn't really ever see in this passage. I wasn't looking for it, but as I begin to dig into it and meditate on it and pray on it, that's what's good about having extra time to really spend in the Word on this. He said this, you must give up your own way and take up the cross and follow me. Because if you hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life... You will save it. Now, that word life, I put it in your notes there, those little italicized words. The word life there is a Greek word, and it's, the way it's spelled there is like psyche. That's not the way you pronounce it in Greek, but it, I love the way it looks, psyche. In other words, the inner part of who you are. It actually means this word, it, it can be translated two ways or more. One of them is life and one of them is soul. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But it means the inner part. The inner health, happiness, and wholeness, the joy, the peace, that that's the life that he's talking about here. He's not talking about you're going to die if you give up your life. No, he's talking about if you give up this inner happiness of what you want, I'm going to end up giving you inner happiness that's way beyond what you get. Now, so this is, this, is the, this is the amazing revelation of this passage. I hope you see it there. He said, you must give up your way of life. In other words, you have to give up your own inner health and happiness for my sake, and then you will save it. Save what? Save life. Well, that word life, but what did we say it meant? What does the word life, psyche, mean? Inner Health and happiness. Enter health and happiness. So if you just kind of get that in your spirit, if you're willing to give up your own inner health and happiness and take my point of view, you're going to actually save it. And that word save, I've shared this with you many more times. It's the Greek word sozo. And it doesn't mean like you're going to get to go to heaven. It's, it's a word which means healing, wholeness, deliverance. And that's what God is promising you. If you're willing to give it up and do it my way, I'm going to actually save it for you. I'm going to deliver it for you. I'm going to bring it to you. Wholeness, health, life, peace, and joy, all the good things of the kingdom. If you do it my way, you'll find those places in there. But when you're trying to do it your way and hold on to your happiness... You end up losing it. Isn't that amazing here? That's the, that's the beautiful part of this, for my sake. Because he goes on, and he says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own what? Soul. That word soul there is the same word. It's psyche. It's the same Greek word. The translator said, well, let's translate it somewhere what different. Because it could have said, you know, if you give up your life for my sake, then you save it. But if then, what is it if you lose your life or gain your life? So in other words, this is still that word, inner happiness, 
inner happiness. He says, would, it, would you lose your own inner happiness? And is anything worth more than your own inner happiness? I mean, think about it. You can have a billion dollars, but if you're not healthy, you're not happy. You're not able to live life. You could be the most powerful person in the nation, but if you don't have inner peace, then you don't have a good life. Some of the most richest, most powerful people are struggling with depression and sadness and brokenness. And, and I pray that there could be someone here that you've been struggling with something that your inner happiness has been on hold for maybe months or years. And part of the reason is because is you're trying to hold on to it. You're trying to grasp after it, but you're trying to do it God's way. And what God is going to promise you here, that if you'll do it his way, take his point of view, the inner happiness, he will bring it in wholeness and healing. Because when we look at that word soul, we always think of, well, he who wins souls is wise, and, and the soul in hell. In other words, we think of that like that's the part that goes to heaven or hell. What is it if you lose your soul and you go to hell? That's not what Jesus was saying. He wasn't saying if you lose your soul and go to hell, because he's talking to people who are saved. What he's talking about is, it, what would, good would it be if you try to hang on to your inner happiness, but then you lose it, and you never gain it, you never live in it, because you're trying to live in the two worlds. And that's where he finds us, and all these other things in our life. Let me, I put it in your notes, but the secret to living within inner happiness and eternal rewards is, number one, is give up your own way. Give up your own way. That's what Jesus was saying. You got to give up your own way. If you really want to do it right, Peter, you got to give up your own way. Your way that you want me alive, you want me close, you want me healing you, you want me personally close to you. That's your way, but that's not God's way. In fact, God's way is going to lead me down a path of suffering and ultimately death. But because of that, I'm going to bring life and healing and wholeness and happiness to you and complete change to your life. we got to give up our own way. So many times when we come to Christ, we want to be saved. We're, sometimes we're afraid, well, we don't want to go to hell, but we really don't want to do it God's point of view. We don't want to adopt God's point of view. We just want our point of view to be satisfied. We're looking for peace. Some come because they're looking for peace and joy, but they're still then trying to hold on to their own life, their own habits, their own everything in their life and then they're struggling why is this jesus thing not working for me because you're still trying to hold on and you hadn't let go everybody say let go give up our own way and number two you got to embrace god's point of view that's what he says if you'll come to my point of view you'll see what god wants and do it that way that's what's going to lead you to pure joy peace and happiness. that's when the healing and wholeness of your life your soul the inner happiness comes when you do it God's way. This is so powerful when we can let go. It's really about lordship. I know so many times, you know, when you come and you try to, well, I'm going to try to get my life together. I'm trying to be a Christian. I'm trying to go to church once in a while. And you're miserable. You know, it's just miserable. It's not fun. It's not ever. But when you finally get totally sold out, that's when all of a sudden it changes. When you just totally give up trying to have your own way and you totally give it to God, it is so much fun, it is so much joy, it is so much peace, because you're right in God's hand, amen? And it doesn't matter what kind of suffering or trial you're going through. It doesn't matter if you lose your job. It doesn't, well, it does. It matters. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because I'm not going to lie to you, it does matter. But not like it is when you're trying to hold on to it. When you're trying to hold on to, God, I want my health back, and I'm not going to be happy without it. I'm not going to be happy if you don't get me out of this jail. I'm not going to be happy if you don't, you know, fix my marriage. I'm not going to, you know, in other words, somehow you can give it all up. I met somebody this week, and I ran into them in a store, and they said uh, their whole life was like falling out, and they had grown kids, and there were all kind of conflicts and other stuff, and they said, well, and I met him in uh, BJ's, and so you, you know who I am, you are if you are. And he said, you know what? I finally decided I couldn't fix any of this. My whole life was all messed up. 
And he said, I just started to say, I'm going to give it to God. And he said, every morning, every noon, and every night, he started praying and giving God praise. And he said, you know what? Everything started falling in place, and now I'm happy. Amen? You see, there's, when you start doing things, it didn't mean were there still some issues in his family life and stress and everything else? Yeah, but you're starting to realize that's God got to fix that, amen? When we quit trying to fix this world and the politics and the nation and all, if you're trying to worry about that, you're not going to ever be happy, amen? So you might as well let that go, give it to God, do your part, and then just go through whatever you want to do. Now, this is the key, is adopting God's point of view in everything. Everything. In fact, I almost said it this thing, everything is spiritual. But number two, every part of our life is spiritually significant. Now, I, I put this part in here because I want you first to, you got to go with God's point of view. But I wanted you to see it, three practical areas that we sometimes leave God out of. We will routinely, no matter how hard we do it, we, we start and we know God needs to be there, and then we forget and we take our point of view in it. And so let me show you three areas that this is significantly significant. Number one, our families are spiritually significant. We think we have a family and we think we have a God life and a church life, and then we have a family life, and that is not true. It's all together. If you would have said to Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, what are you about your, uh, your family life or your living life and the, the carpentry life and, and all those other things and your, your relationship with God, how, how do you live those differently? He just said, I don't, because I'm with him all the time. I am connected with my father continuously. Our families are spiritually significant. Now, I could show you, we could just show you about, I can't tell you how many scriptures, but I just, for the sake of this, one scripture in Colossians 3.17. Let me read it to you. Whatever you do or say, how many of y'all know that pretty much covers it all? <laughs> whatever you do, whatever you say, probably the only way we could have got it and we could find another scripture, whatever you're thinking, because you're Thinking is stinking. Amen. <laughs> whatever you do, whatever you say, how are we to do it? As a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is right there. Everything is spiritual. Everything you do, everything you say has to have God in it, has to be thought from God's point of view. What does Jesus would do? Amen. What would Jesus say? But no, what would I say in my relationship with him? But now, look, he says that in this setup of this passage, but look, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And then he goes on and says, it's about families. Wives, submit your husband as fitting to the what? Those who what? In other words, how we belong to the Lord and our relationship with our husband and our wife are connected. So many people think they're different. I love God. I hate my spouse. I love God, my spouse gets on my nerves. I love God, my spouse breaks my heart. I love God, my spouse doesn't help me. I love God, but you know, this is always conflict. You need to figure this thing out. Because what he's gonna say is, if you're trying to hold, what you're trying to hold on to and make happen will be healed when you get God's point of view. Now let me go on. He says, wives submit just like, you know, uh, that fitting to those who belong to husbands love your wife and never treat them harshly. In another passage, he says, husbands love your wives. How? Just like Christ loved the church. Whoa, that's spiritual, amen? That's super spiritual. In fact, everything that you are in your marriage is a visible expression of Jesus and the church. And that's why the devil hates it so much. And you need to get that on your, your radar that your marriage is a representation of Christ in the church. Every day, every moment, you're living that point of view. And then he goes on and he says, don't treat them harshly. He says, then children, always obey your parents. Why? For this what? Pleases the Lord. In other words, my life, how I live it with my family 
how we function with respect and love and submission and obedience is all a spiritual exercise. You're trying to keep it separate. You're trying to do it from a psychological way. You're trying to do it the way the media tells you you should do it. You're trying to do it the way your neighbor is doing it, your best friend is doing it. And I'm telling you, those points of views don't count. What does count is God's point of view. How does he want you to live it out? And when you start living it with his points of view, what you then do with your family is you pour everything into that. My goal in life, because I, and I, I had, I didn't know this in the beginning. When I was 20 years old, I was married, and I was a selfish, selfish man. You know, that's just what 20-year-olds are, amen? And I thought I could not think, and I wasn't really totally surrendered to the Lord. But a few years after that, I got surrendered to the Lord. And when I did, I had a transformation of my mind, heart, and soul. Now, it wasn't the instant because us guys are a little dumb, amen? Ladies, do you agree? I mean, you men, you might as well. We're just a little dumb. It takes a while, but we've been at this a long time. But finally, I got a revelation is I need to do everything in my power to make her happy. And all the women said, you know, I mean, just that's it. I need to do what pleases the Lord. What will make her happy? And then what will Christ love her like Christ loves the church? She needs to know every day of her life that she is loved. Now, some women need different things to know that, you know, and you've got to figure that out for your spouse. But my role every day is say, I love you. Isn't that right? Every day she wants a kiss. Every day she wants me to go to bed with her at the same time, even if the sun is up shining. <laughs> Every day she wants me to get out of bed if I, if I got to do it and go on her side of the bed and give her a kiss. Now, see, that's not fair. But you know what? I gave up being fair because it's not about being fair. I'm the greatest servant. I'm going to lay down my life to please her. Now, I'm not perfect at this, so don't get you a thing. But that, <clears throat> every day I try to prove to her I love her. I sacrifice. I serve her. I cook. I clean. If she's cooking and cleaning, I'm on my feet cooking and cleaning. If she needs something and we're on the couch, I get up and get it. Because she says, sweetheart, I just sat down. But you did too, but you... <clears throat> we could go on a long time about this. Let me just tell you that when you try to hold on, to your joy, peace, and happiness, and your equality and treatment, you'll never have it. But as soon as you give it up and lose it, and then totally sacrifice, give 110% of yourself away, you get back amazing returns. Amen? Amen. You get back, guys, I'm going to tell you, you get back stuff we can't even talk about right here, amen? <laughs> so you need to know this. But there's peace, there's joy, Every day, she needs to be told, you're beautiful. Every day, that, that looks beautiful. Every day, she needs to be held. Every day, I need to serve her. Every day. Everybody say every day. Every day. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Now, if yours doesn't want that, then don't give it to her. Amen? Give her what she needs and wants. And the same thing back with the husbands. Find out what you do to respect them, to honor them, to submit. To, how do you pull them up and esteem them? We don't have time. I'm running out of time, okay? In fact, I'm out of time. Amen. Your family is spiritual. Number two, our work is spiritually significant. It says in Ephesians 6 and 5, slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Now, you can get all hung up on the word slave, but it just means worker. It's just someone who's working for someone else. Let's just get the, the context of that because it, it was probably even a voluntary arrangement that he came into slavery. Serve them how? Sincerely. As you would serve what? Christ. Try to please them. See, that's that word again. All the time, not just when they're watching. As slaves of Christ, you do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working how? Enthusiasm, sincerity, pleasing, self-sacrificing. 
And remember that the Lord will reward each one of you for the good you do, whether we're slaves or free. Again, there's that word reward. Your work is spiritual. You will totally not be happy in your work. You will struggle in your work. You will feel undervalued. You will feel mistreated. You will feel abused. You will never find peace and joy till you get to the point that you say, I thank God for my work. I love my place of work. I'm going to give it 110% because I'm not just serving here. I'm serving God. Amen. And when you start doing that, you will do it. He says specifically, with enthusiasm. We go to work so many times trying to give the least amount because I don't want to do more than Bill because I, look at them. They're sitting over there. I don't, I'm doing everything. You start doing everything, you might own the company one day, amen? <laughs> you quit whining and just enjoy life. And if you don't, just be happy. The joy and peace is when you give it up, you quit trying to hold on, you quit trying to measure, and then God fills your heart with this, I am like having a ball. I used to love work. Every job I've ever had, I've loved, almost. You know, and literally, I've worked some terrible, 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 I mean, I've been this, you know, clean out hog pens when it was that deep, you know, with a shovel and on the farm, you know, but I, I just love work. And I, love, and I always throw myself in it, but when I got the better job, I always say, thank you, Lord. Amen. This is even better. That's what you go through life with sincerity. It's spiritual. Your work, you, I always say this all the time, you should be the very best worker there. You should be the happiest. You should be the hardest worker. You should be early. You should stay late. You should honor your boss. You should say, yes, sir, how can I help you? You should be the very best employee. Not because you're trying to get promoted, but you will, but because you're honoring Christ. Can anybody say amen to that? Oh, man, I might have to preach a series on this or something. Number three, our finances are spiritually significant. It says in 1 Timothy, tell them to use their money. Everybody say use money. Money is an instrument of exchange that you use. It's something you use, just like sowing seed in India, sowing seed in the church that's growing and changing lives. You're doing something that's spiritually significant, but everything we do with our money is significant. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. And then again, look what it says. By doing this, they will be doing what? Storing up treasure as a good foundation the future so they may experience true life. You know, and then I, I close this as we get ready to close. I know I'm out of time. He said in Proverbs, honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first fruits of your cross. Then, everybody say then. Yeah. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim with new wine. He didn't say, when you get full barns and vats and brimming and everything is good, and you think you finally have enough money that you can do something to honor the Lord, that's when you do it. That's not what he said, is it? He said, honor. I really believe it's every day of your life to save, to make wise choices, to get out of debt. All those things, I could teach you all about finances, and there's so many things. There's so many financial principles. Just go to Proverbs, read one every day. That's what I'm doing now. Proverbs every day. There's so much wisdom. Jesus taught more on money than he did forgiveness. He taught more on money than he did prayer. And we make more mistakes. We got generations of people who are going to live in poverty because they're not doing it God's way. And the more they try to hold on to it, the more they're losing it. Or if they start to figure out how to do it God's way, it's going to be healing and wholeness to your finances. I can, I can tell you, I, I've been with so little that we didn't know how to get it through the next week. I've lived off of $3,000 a year and was married and had a kid. I'm going to tell you that God's good. His ways work. And when you totally sell out to him, where you quit trying to do it your way, quit holding on to your point of view and your friend's point of view and your neighbor's point of view and say, what is God's point of view? You're going to find life, health, happiness, and joy and peace in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. Oh, God, I'm so full of this word. I wish I could just share so much more. But, Lord, I pray that it speaks to these hearts. Let it be a seed that grows and grows over their families, their work, their finances. Every aspect of their life is spiritual. (laughs) And so, Lord, now we just pray you just use us. And, Lord, I'm praying for people that are going to move from a place of darkness and despair and wrong health, wrong marriages, messed up lives because they've been trying to hold on to it. And they're going to let it go. And they're going to start seeing peace and joy and healing. That's what I declare over them, Father, because that's what your word has said. Now you're here and maybe you're watching online or you're at Middletown and you would say, Pastor Steve, I don't know Jesus as Lord, though. That's your first step is lordship. Because that's what we're talking about is total surrender to his way. And if you want to start there, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Let's pray. Say, Heavenly Father, I surrender to your lordship. To the lordship of Jesus Christ. To living my life his way. Because his way is the right way. I give up my point of view and I adopt your point of view that Jesus is the way. He is the truth and he is salvation. I receive him as my Lord and I surrender my life to him and I will follow him all my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise for every one of those decisions. If you made some kind of decision, I'd like to send you some help. And just to know and celebrate with you, if you take one of the Connect cards here and just check the box and give us whatever you're comfortable with. If it's just an email, I'll send it to you via email. Whether you're here or at Middletown, drop it in the offering bucket when it's coming by in just a moment. Or if you don't have it in time, give it to the info center at your campus. And if you're watching online, somewhere in the world, this message is spoken to you and you want to connect hit that connect button and give us your email and I'll make sure you get that information right away too. God bless you. I'm excited because this is going to change your life for inner health, hope, and happiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God praise. Amen. God bless you.